Okay, welcome Daniel Dombach to this management talk about the future of warehousing. This is a cooperation between Supply Chain Effect, which is a Nordic uh, magazine, and Sevra Technologies. Can you, Daniel, please start by telling us who you are and what your responsibilities are at Sebra? Absolutely. Thank you, Stefan. So, as you rightly said, my name is Daniel Dombach. I'm part of the European organization of Sebra Technologies. Um, my title is Director Industry Solutions, and that means that we have a dedicated sales team focusing on solutions for our different vertical markets. So there are colleagues who are focusing on retail, another one on healthcare, and I'm the subject matter expert for transportation logistics and manufacturing, so to say, supply chain. Mm. And of course, warehouse housing is a key uh, area in that, in that sense. Absol uh, absolutely. And of course, we see quite some overlap, especially with, with our friends from retail. So engagement, my engagement is not just limited to uh, transportation logistics and manufacturing, but I speak also to many logistic departments of retailers. Not so long ago, I think it was about 10, perhaps 15 years ago, uh, people talked a lot about getting rid of warehouses, actually. Uh, there was kind of a vision for the warehouse free distribution chain. A lot of this was based on lean thinking, where everything should, you know, be taken away that didn't uh, add any value. Today is a very different landscape, and and we see warehouses are growing when, as we speak. Uh, what what's your perspective on this? Yeah, you're absolutely right. And the warehouses are not not only growing, we're getting more and more warehouses. Um, well, 10, 15 years ago, as you said, um, there was a complete different behavior of people um, shopping. Nobody was shopping online those days. This is state of the art now. Um, almost everybody goes to any of the big big e-commerce shops and is ordering online. And what we see, especially the last couple of years, that people have a high demand um, to receive the goods very fast. So when in the past, maybe same week shipment was okay for everybody, and then it was maybe three days, and then, well, thanks to Amazon Prime and Walmart, um, it was next day delivery, and maybe in some cases, even same day delivery. Um, well, in order to match that that need and that desire of customers, you need to be very close to the customers in order to be able to deliver on the next day, which means the warehouses need to be all over the country and all over the places to be close to the end customers so that you can deliver the same day. And that's what we've seen. There are more warehouses being built and the warehouses are becoming bigger. You you also use the five Vs. I spoke to yes. you before and you, you mentioned velocity, volume, variety, visibility and value. Can, can you explain how, how these words kind of describe what's happening now in, in, in the context of warehouse development? Absolutely. So, um, well, velocity I already explained um, in my previous answer. It's all about being able to deliver fast to the end customer. Um, and visibility obviously means on the one hand, being the e-commerce company, you need to have the entire vis the visibility about your entire inventory. You need to know which product is, is at which location um, and how fast can I move products between my locations, my different warehouses. And for me, my as a good, Consumer um, visibility means I want to see when is it arriving. Will I get an advance shipping notice? Can I may maybe even track? And that's something uh, some of the courier companies are doing. Can I track where the delivery uh, van is? Maybe I can see on a map he is five streets away from where I am, and he has to see another three customers. Um, and it will give me a dedicated uh, window of arrival. So I know in in the next 90 minutes. Um, the shipment will arrive at my place. So that's that's clearly what it is. Um, variety obviously means um, the number of items in a warehouse is growing. However, the number of items I shop at once has, has been going down in the past. So when, when in the past I was maybe shopping five to 10 items at once, now with very easy um, contracts like Amazon Prime, um, well, sometimes I order three different items in three different orders throughout a day which of course is another challenge for everybody. Um, well, lastly, what is important as well is the entire area of returns. Um, people want the goods fast and for free, 
and they want to have the ability for a very easy return um, method. So if I if I order something, and that's specifically true for, for the fashion market, if I order maybe two pairs of jeans because I'm not too, uh, entirely sure about the, the exact size, or maybe I want to try two different colors, um, I order both, I receive both, I try them on, and I send one pair of jeans back, um, which is another challenge for the for the industry because it needs to be collected again, it needs to be transported back, it will, will be received in the warehouse, it needs to be inspected if it's good or anything wrong with it, if it can go back to sales, if the customer needs to be reimbursed and so on. So all these things play into a very complex scenario for warehouses. The, all the, the, the consumer behavior that you described now has also sustainability dimension that, that uh, people are increasingly speaking about. Uh, do you have any views on that? Yeah, we see that, of course, uh, big time as well. P people are looking into, into this um, and the logistics companies are taking quite some effort to be as sustainable as possible. Um, for example, example for Germany, wh where I live, uh, Deutsche Post DHL uh, is using in large urban areas electrical vehicles. So the, the little vans they're using are 100% uh, battery powered. Um, to reduce the carbon footprint of the entire fleet. And we see that trend in, in many other uh, regions as well. There's a lot of more smart planning and route scheduling and stuff like that also going on. So, Absolutely, that plays, of, of course, another important role. Um, if you know you have to deliver 50 parcels, um, you want to be as accurate as possible, you want to be on time, and you want to minimize the route you're driving. And that's why modern software uh, for route planning plays an important role in today's business. Yes. Last year, 2019, you you publicized a report called Warehousing Vision Study from Sebra. And in that report, there's a lot of interesting stuff. I can recommend it. But one thing that you conclude that is, is very interesting is that, that you see that there's happening a lot within the warehouse, but at the same time, the adaption of new technologies uh, is going slow. Uh, there seems to be a gap here between vision and reality, if you want. Uh, what do you think is holding companies back? Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. And, and even in, in these times where we have the limitation and the lockdowns in some countries due to the COVID-19 situation, um, that has gained more importance here. So holding back is, it's in some cases, really difficult. Um, to modify your processes and the way you're working in a warehouse or maybe even update your WMS. That is a very long lasting and painful exercise, which you can't do as easy as possible. Um, also the demand, so the volume in the five Bs, the demand uh, of products is going up and more items are being shipped all the time. So warehouses in many cases are operating um, at high volume. You could even say peak time. And especially nowadays, when various countries we have lockdowns, people are ordering more online. Um, these companies are operating on, well, kind of peak season Christmas mode every day these days. So there's absolutely no time right now to do that. However, having said that, um, quite some customers have come back to me already saying, well, we underestimated um, the need for an improved, for improved efficiency in a warehouse and we want to review our processes. And we want to um, take the next evolutionary step with our technology in order to make all the processes more efficient um, so that we can do better work in the future. So they are not waiting for some kind of further technological breakthrough like uh, automation coming in and then they kind of get stalled or stuck in the middle here between the old warehouse technologies and waiting for something that is more of a vision. Um, yeah, very much believe so. Um, well, what we're sometimes trying to classify where our customers, and we have identified five phases here, coming from doing just very opportunistic scanning, maybe incoming goods and maybe picking it outgoing, but all the rest is not really done with, with modern technology, um, but with pen and paper or, or other things. And there's quite some steps of evolution in between, using more devices, using wearable technology, maybe using head up displays to have a very easy way to get the working instructions in your line of sight up into lots of sensors so you know where the goods are. So location-based technologies using RFID up to uh, robots and cobots assisting the work in a warehouse.
Mm. Um, all of this is there. Um, if you are in a very early stage with your warehouse development, it probably won't make sense to go to the very high end using um, sensors all over and using uh, autonomous vehicles or robots in your warehouse. No. And one thing that, that also surprised me in the report, the warehouse and vision study, uh, is that uh, 27% I think of the respondents in the study say that they think that they will have totally automized warehouses in just five years. Uh, do you see that as realistic or is it more a question of wishful thinking here? Mm, that's a very good question. I was I was a bit surprised when I saw that figure as well. Well, we said before lots of new warehouses being built and referring to this warehouse vision study, I think the number of more new warehouses being built within the next five years is something in the 20, 20 something percent and the size is going up as well. So if you're building a new warehouse, now there's a really good chance to have lots of automation in there. If you have an existing warehouse, which is running for quite a while and you have maybe 500,000 SKUs in there or a million SKUs, I think it will be very difficult to fully automate that warehouse. Certain elements, bits and pieces, yes, but everything um, almost impossible. So I can, I can think of new warehouses being built, being fully automa automated. 27% sounds a very high number though. Yes. Uh, what would you say then are the main features of tomorrow's warehouses? If we say that, let's say that tomorrow is in five years, uh, what, what what will it look like compared to today? Yeah, so um, I think automation will have its its way into warehouses. We will see more more of automation, whether that is robots. Just to give an example. What we see already these days with companies like Fetch Robotics or Locus Robotics, um, if you look at the area of picking, the pickers will no more walk through the entire warehouse and pick the single items customers are ordering. They are in charge now for a certain area, maybe one or two aisles. And a little robot will be driving to that picker and he has information maybe on a tablet, which the picker will review, pick the object and put it into, into a box which this vehicle is carrying and acknowledging and then this robot is moving on. That is one option um, which goes goes hand in hand with technology we call fulfillment edge, which also is optimizing the roads and the where and, and, and the walking ways in the warehouse. The other one definitely will be um, wearable technology. And I think first and foremost, the biggest interest we see in these days are head up displays. So that is, for example, you wearing a security glass which has a little attached um, device um, on top. With, which carries a prism, which shows you your working instructions in your line of sight. So you're no more carrying a, a smart computer in your hands. Maybe you have a little one on your arm with a wearable computer um, and you would have a ring scanner. You have both hands free and it shows you the way where to go and it shows you which location to grab into to pick the item and how many items. Um, that is something that is starting big time now and we believe it will be mainstream in a couple of years, big time. The other, the other area where we clearly see um, movement is the entire area of Internet of Things. So using sensor technology to understand um, which object is where in the warehouse. So having location information, maybe through RFID technology in the warehouse, you know exactly where is which product, where is which worker, where is, is which forklift. Um, and device so that you can optimize uh, flows in the warehouse as well through this information, um, which will all drive you into something we call pervasive computing. So everything is, is driven through that and through data analytics uh, and machine learning, you will be able to further optimize your processes. Sounds like an exciting uh, work environment. I mean, uh, sometimes people used to talk about uh, warehouse work as dull, dirty and dangerous, but, but nowadays it's really shifting. And uh, how do you see the, the need for new competences within and around the warehouse in the future? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. Um, well, one of the, the challenges we see today is that we have a shortage of labor. Having more warehouses and bigger warehouses requires more workers, but in many areas they are still not available. So technology needs to go in there. If we're moving forward into more automated 
operations of warehouses using robots or cobots. Of course, the skill level of workers is changing as well. These devices need to be uh, monitored, maintained, um, um, inspected, so um, there will be different levels of qualification. On the other hand, um, using modern technology in the hands of the workers, so to say, um, mobile computers with modern user interfaces like, like, like Android operating system and graphical user interfaces and touchscreens makes it a lot easier to perform the work. Mm. Will there still be, it sounds as if you think that there still will be people in the warehouse in let's say 10 years from now uh, when you explain how, how you perceive the, the different technologies and, and so on. Yeah, true. Well, we, we were just talking about 27% fully automated warehouses in five years. So let's see what that number is in 10 years. Um, still, um, there will still be people required to complete all the tasks. If the if the automation will unload trucks, uh, store um, the object somewhere, do the, all the cross docking, do the picking, um, still workers will be needed to do exception handling, to do maintenance um, and uh, to perform extra tasks. Yes. We see now that warehouse automation is definitely bo booming all over the world, not everywhere perhaps, but certainly here in the, in the Nordics and in many other places. And Sebra Technologies has since quite many years uh, invested in, in companies and startups within uh, robot, robotization and so on. Uh, what's, what's the strategy and, uh, and idea behind this and, and how will, will this benefit your core business and your customers. Yeah, that's a very good point. In fact, uh, we have invested in, in various robotics companies. I already mentioned two right now, which was Fetch Robotics and Locus Robotics. Um, of course, we see that the processes will change over time in a warehouse and that our technology and our solutions need to be um, included in those concepts uh, which will go into warehouses. That's why we're working with these companies. So. Having a financial investment with those companies is just one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is, of course, a closed technology corporation. So our, de our development organizations uh, synchronizing and going um, into similar product development directions. And of course, from a sales perspective, working hand in hand with the colleagues from those companies to address the needs of customers in the warehouses jointly. So you, you, you're doing this now with these companies going together and so on yes uh, to the market okay interesting daniel we're finally we need to speak a, a bit about the the, the strange uh, society and surrounding that we have right now with covid19 and the corona outbreak that is perhaps uh, we're in the midst of right now uh, we will for many many years now i think talk about this and the effects and so on but how do you think now in this uh, phase of it, how, how will the pandemic affect our supply chains, inventory and warehousing? Yeah, it's a good point. As I, as I mentioned earlier, um, what we see right now is a very, very high demand in online orders. Um, and I was saying that many of those companies um, and warehouses are operating at maximum capacity these days. Um, so they need to align the, pro the, the, the processes. And, um, and as I was saying before, um, I had a couple of calls from companies um, in various regions in Europe just saying, we need to be sure once this is over, um, we get ready, maybe we get another um, epidemic or pandemic at some point in time, maybe in two, three, whatever years. Um, so there is a high demand to review the current processes, the strategies to invest into new technology um, and make your processes as easy and lean and smart uh, as possible. So there's, well, for Zebra Sales, for example, there's a high demand these days to work with these companies. The very, very large players in these markets have already approached us and have been ordering additional devices because they're hiring lots of temporary staff right now to fulfill all the need. So um, this is right now, um, a booming business for us. Mm. This will certainly affect the, the supply chains and also the business models of the supply chains in the future. Absolutely. Daniel, very nice talking to you about the future of warehousing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stefan. It's been a real pleasure.
Welcome, Matthias Lindström, uh, to this management talk about the future of warehousing. Uh, you are the director regional sales in the Nordics, uh, Sebra. Can can you can you describe to our uh, viewers what what, uh, what what this works your work looks like, looks like? Yeah, thank you very much, Stefan, for for having me and interesting to to be in this this discussion also with you uh, during the circumstances that we have uh, have ongoing now. No, my role is uh, I'm leading the, the business for Zebra in, in the Nordics, and I've been doing that for almost six years. And Zebra Technologies is um, a company that put technology in the front line of the, of the workers out there, especially for the enterprise market. So uh, my role is to, is to drive the business from a daily perspective in the Nordics and um, with an organization consisting of approximately of 30 people. Uh, but all our business is going through the channel, uh, our resellers and, and channel partners. So that's a little bit how it looks like. Uh, this strategy uh, that you have selling through resellers, uh, I think that many times uh, some of these resellers are much more known for, for the general business community than, than Sebrae's. Can, can you mention some of these uh, partners that you have? Yeah, for sure. We have, um, we are normally categorized and I mean two, two different categories. Uh, the first one are the, are the, I would say, the resellers that buy directly from Zebra. That could be companies like TGCS, Toshiba. It, and then you have the second category, which are the more regional based one, not international in that sense. And it could be companies like Strongpoint, uh, Datema, Optidev, uh, Optiscan, uh, Lexit, for example. Uh, and they normally operate in I would say one or more countries around the Nordics. Um, so there are two different categories. And then of course we have a third category also, and that is actually the ISVs or the independent software vendors who normally doesn't um, um, supply any type of hardware. They do it more from a software perspective and applications perspective. Thank you. Uh, how how do you how is the Nordic market uh, developing for for Zebra or, or the different Nordic markets? Uh, as I understand it, you are doing quite well, aren't you? Yeah, that's correct, Stefan. We we have been doing a, a really good job um, in the Nordics for the I would say the last four to five years, and during the last three years we have had a really positive um, you know, growth in the territory and gro growing all over the business in the all four countries that, that we operate in, which are uh, Sweden, Denmark, uh, Norway and Finland. And also we have Iceland, which is handled on, and managed under um, uh, Norway. And uh, that business, uh, the business overall has gone very well, uh, especially during the last three years, uh, driven by a lot of, of, uh, of different industries and so on. So um, it's been a, yeah, it's been a quite good journey, journey also. And, um, so, so that, that that's really positive, yeah. As I understand it, not, not only Zebra, but but the warehouse uh, technology segment is growing in in general. What what is what are the main driving forces behind this growth that we see? Um, but I would say from a from an overall perspective, of course, the, our business is is driven also a lot by by the boom of e-commerce and the on-demand economy. Um, you also have a technology shift in uh, in the enterprise operations, going from from Windows based applications more into Android based. Uh, so changing, I would say, to a more efficient and effective um, work processes in general. That is driving, uh, of course, the the growth in, in the territory. I would say also if you look at from a from a vertical perspective, we normally categorize uh, our business into four different verticals. Uh, we have uh, we have retail, uh, which stands for I would say plus forty percent of the, of the business for Zebra. Then you have transport and logistics. You have manufacturing and you have healthcare. And if you look into the to the boom in the Nordics, and I think that's applicable for for many other regions also as well, is is food food retail is is, is, a, is a big driver. Uh, and uh, also the transport and logistics. And uh, I would also say um, 
now what is happening also is that that trend has come to um, when you are modernizing the, the warehouse and manufacturing sites with going from old technology to, to more new uh, modern technology. Mm. If we in, in this management talk, we, we focus on the future of warehousing specifically. Uh, what, 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 are, what are the most, uh, where are the big investments that you have there today? What is the demand? What kind of products and technology is the market demanding? I would say that um, you, can, you can categorize the warehouse into 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 different um, uh, different verticals or different industries. Uh, if you look into the total supply chain, you will see that you will find warehouses that support uh, the food retailers. Uh, you will have a warehouse that um, store stuff for for being provided out for the e-commerce market, which could be the either the the big transport and logistics uh, companies like. Schenker, DHL, uh, local ones that we have in, in the international, but local ones that you have in Denmark, like DSV. Uh, you have third party logistics company. Uh, they are also containing of warehouses. And of course you have warehouses within, within manufacturing and, and so on. And I would say in terms of, of products and solution, all is driven by a little bit, I would say the, the on demand and the, the the on demand economy that everybody wants to have um, they want to have their products delivered in uh, uh, now it's not it's not a wait a week or two and that of course uh, is putting a lot of pressure into warehousing that you need to have a, a modern system and so everything from you know they need to maybe upgrade or modernizing their their wms system then they will need to develop new applications and when they developing the new applications they need for sure um, mobile computers from from companies like zebra they need scanners they need vehicle mounted computers they need uh, uh, tablets um, and scanners and also other types of technology to to make a faster route within the warehouse that could be uh, technology like RFID, for example. So uh, that kind of that kind of products we're delivering into the market, and of course our our legacy product in terms of um, barcode printing, where you need or in the need of putting putting a, a sticker or a, or a mark yeah, or supplies on a on a on a on a on a box or on a parcel or mark up a pallet or whatever it is. There's a lot of, of good and, and uh, technologies that to be used in order to make the warehouse more efficient and, and more effective and agile, of course. But at the same time, we can see in the in the report that you uh, Sebra issued last year called Warehousing Vision Study that 77% uh, of the respondents there uh, said that they had a, an urgent need for modern, modernization but also that they are slow when it comes to adapt to new technologies. Uh, is this something that we also see on the on the Nordic markets? Yeah, but I would say yeah, you're you're right on there, and I think that that has a certain I wouldn't say fault of that is also that they that they sit in in old maybe old systems. It could be an uh, I wouldn't say maybe, but a, but like an you know, unfashioned. Um, type of WMS system, which are not ready to to actually for, 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 the, for the new type of stuff, so to say. And that, of course, is preventing them. So I would say that I think that the majority of, of, uh, of the respondents that were in that uh, survey, they also uh, highlighted the, the IT uh, technology or the IT systems behind as one of the reasons for not being maybe fast enough which they maybe want to be. Okay. It's the question of the old legacy systems as so often. Yeah, normally that puts a little bit of stick in the wheel uh, sometimes that uh, um, the, the underlying or the overlaying system is, is the one that can maybe prevent uh, a faster adoption of new technology, yes. 
it's, it's well known that in the Nordics we have quite high labor costs compared to, to most countries actually. Yeah. Uh, this making it a bit easier to, to sell and implement technologies in the, for, for, warehouse, for warehousing here in the Nordics. Yeah, that, that, that is, cause of course, could be one of the drivers. I would say that in the warehouse, you normally also have a, uh, uh, the, the, I mean, you, the people there may not work in there for, for, for a longer period in life sometimes. So you need to to uh, be, be able to onboard people quite rapidly and quite quick. And I would say with with um, with new type of applications, which is more visual based, like Android is, I would say that it's you get a quicker um, upstart of people that coming in there. That is also affecting their cost. And uh, I would say. Of course, the, we always hear that the labor costs are high in the Nordics, and, and for sure it is. So that is, of course, but but like like every other, I would say, technology shift, you need to have an, an underlying business case that could justify your investments. But of course, putting in the labor cost into that perspective, of course, affected, yes. Mm. What would you say are the main features of tomorrow's warehouses? I mean, we have here the for this, this, this discussion we have the concept of the future future warehouse the vision of the future warehouse uh, no no one can know for sure but what would you say are the typical features of, of the warehouse in in let's say 10 years from now how what will it look like but i think we are on a i mean we are definitely on a journey where they, that where we see a, a total modernization of a warehouse and um, and i would say that you will you will have you have a mix uh, and that is also starting today that you have fully automated warehouses uh, but i mean that is normally driven by when you're building out the totally new building you also need to think of that many companies and many type of uh, yeah in, in this industry they are sitting on a, a existing facilities that they actually need to modernize and it's not always that simple to go for a fully automation. So we see a we see a trend now where first of all this technology shift is going from the old legacy old system base into a more modern uh, graphical interface where you can learn. It's more interactive in that sense to 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 adopt uh, working processes and so on. So I think we also we we see definitely um, a little bit these robotic things where you have a you still have a human interaction, and then you have that combined with with the automation in, the, in that sense. Uh, so you can see like uh, you use more visual based uh, technology, and we, we have used to have a, a technology shift from you know picking with pen and paper, going into a mobile computer, going into voice related um, applications. Now we see also a trend of going more for a visual base where you maybe put your you put some you put glasses on and you have a, a, a vision of where you should pick things which meaning that you are not that dependent on on uh, knowing the language so you can actually maybe take people that that comes from abroad and they don't they don't need to have the skill in the local language so that, that's a, that's a quick adoption and putting people into work I would say to meet that demand that that people um, working in the warehouse for, for sometimes a short period of time. So that is one thing we see. We see also um, robots uh, that uh, I mean go and pick stuff uh, instead of instead of humans. But I would say that you will see it maybe as an, a little bit of a hybrid world for some years now. A uh, little bit like the automotive industry where you have a shift from 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 fuel into more a hybrid car and then come the electricity cars. But I would say also the the work process in a warehouse will for sure be manual also because you need to have some kind of flexibility also in terms of delivery. Not everything could be predefined, so to say. You you are responsible for all the the Nordic countries, as we said, for the for the sales. Uh, do you see any any differences? Uh, are there any? Is there any specific country that is more eager or mature, eager to invest in new technology or, or more mature or 
anything like that? Or are we quite similar? No, I, I would say that the, the Nordic market, I mean, Nordic region overall is very export dependent region in that sense that we that we export a lot of stuff into other countries. And I would say we have a lot of international companies with a, with a, with a headquarter and a base in the Nordics. And I don't think that it doesn't make a difference if, if that company is, is located in Finland or if it's located in Sweden, the demand is more driven from an overall perspective. So we don't see, we at least don't see that there should be a, that there is a big difference between uh, willingness to invest or to switch to uh, a different technology or over over the, the the country the borders no we don't see that mm. we are probably quite uh, similar in in many aspects actually although we tend perhaps uh, uh, to, to to see the differences many times yeah but, from, from a culture perspective we could be a little bit different for sure uh, but I think from a, I mean, from a, from a business perspective, we are an export dependent region and we have, I mean, a lot of good old legacy companies in, in, in I mean, with everything from, from Volvo to H&M to Wärtsilä in, in Finland, you have big food groceries that are, I mean, working just on the, on the local market. You have in Finland, you have S Group in Sweden, you have Ica, you have Coop is a big one in Norway. and. I mean, and Denmark and so on. So, so um, then we are quite similar with the underlying demand. It's, it's pretty much the same, I would say. Yes. Right now we're speaking, we're, we're having a Teams interview uh, discussion here with, with, with you and also with your colleagues, Daniel and Paul from, from Zebra. And we're, we're partly doing this because of COVID-19 now and the corona pandemic. And, uh, and this, of course, affects the supply chains and also the future warehousing. Uh, how do you perceive this? How do you see that this will affect the warehouses in the future? Despite the fact that it could be quite challenging sitting in the same room for eight weeks, uh, home, home office based, I think that um, I mean, there's definitely gonna gonna happen a lot of things. I would say post COVID-19, uh, because I think that um, companies and, and I mean also our society will see that we we can't be fully dependent on on one one place sourcing in that sense. I mean, having the maybe 95 percent of all world factories is located in in, in asia and in, and in china i think that will of course um create maybe a little bit of a different strategies in terms of also warehousing i think that there will be a demand that uh, maybe a more of a regional based uh, storage in that sense uh, i also believe that there will be more a drive for maybe not just one one place sourcing more into multiple sites where you can where you can have your supply chain so that there's definitely going to be some some big change related to this but as always we i mean we we tend to get back to to normal but a little bit depending on how, how long this will be ongoing our uh, i would say our availability to actually uh, change your behavior or change things for real will we will we'll, we'll, we'll get higher, I would say. So I, I, I believe there's going to be changes there. And of course, that will also drive, I would say, maybe increase the technology shift, the ones that haven't done it fully yet, because you can just see what happened in, in certain industries now when there were total lockdown in the society and the demand for, for uh, I mean, groceries into, into, into the food retailers that demand has peaked uh, i mean we have customers that have uh, home delivery in that sense they are picking up the basket in the store and i mean from within a week then in the beginning of the covid 19 the demand growth from with over 400 percent and then a week later it has grown the double so you can also imagine that that has a big effect on the underlying supply chain of course and and i think that 
the companies and, and also the customers are maybe their willingness to, to, to or, or I would say, the, yeah, the, the willingness to invest uh, in uh, in new technology that actually going to support this kind of situation will uh, maybe easen up even more after this. So mm. I think it will be a change, definitely, yes. It certainly will. The question is how, of course, and in, in what way. Many people uh, expect uh, the, the kind of reshoring that you spoke about here in the beginning of your answer. Uh, many more companies will take production and storing and so forth back closer to, to their home markets. And, and I suppose this would, would further drive the, the, the local sales here in Sebra Nordics, if that will happen. Now, indeed, because you will also, I think that the demand for, for building new warehouses will come. Uh, and I mean, you need in some way to maybe better secure the, the supply chain. And that will, of course, um, to be able to do that, you 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 need to to invest in in, in new technology. So, yeah, nor normally our industry that we operate in, when it comes a little bit of tough times and and companies need to more be more effective and so on, um, our type of products and solutions normally fits that demand. And 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 so during this type of times, I would say that that. Um, our business tend to be quite stable and, and, and then after when it's over have a, have a continuous growth on it, yes. Thank you Matthias for a nice uh, discussion. Thank you very much Stefan, it was a pleasure to, to discuss it with you also. Okay, welcome Paul Reed. You have a, lo a long and impressive title, Regional Product Manager Enterprise Mobile Computing at Sebra Technologies. Uh, please tell us about yourself and what's what's behind that title. Sure, so um, yeah, so it's, as you said, it's a lengthy title. Um, I've been in the industry for over 20 years. I spent 10 years as a technical sales uh, in mobile computing and I, I joined when it was back in the days of uh, uh, no Wi-Fi. In fact, the Wi-Fi standard was, was uh, founded while I was in, in employment. Um, so I've seen a, a lot of changes in that. Um, my title, I'm responsible for the warehouse portfolio for Zebra Technologies, uh, which is uh, about 13 devices uh, of different form factors and shapes. Um, they're used in the warehouse operations, all mobile computers uh, of different forms. Um, and my responsibility is uh, the birth to death of those devices. So I get the privilege of evangelizing to customers and users and to resellers uh, and talk about where we see technology going but more importantly, we also get to listen to them uh, and hear what they see as demands, what the users uh, are trying to achieve. It's all well and good us coming out with the technology, but if it's not practical, it doesn't bring a benefit, it's not the right size and weight, uh, then uh, it's absolutely no use. I mean, if I bring out a mobile computer that's too heavy for someone that's got to use it for eight hours a day, um, I, I've not succeeded. So my role is really to uh, listen to people, collect their feedback and try and bring out the best mobile device that's going to help them for their business and, and step them forward. Mm, sounds challenging and exciting. <laughs> what, what do you see is the most uh, interesting development right now within the area of warehouse technology, broadly speaking, not, not just the mobile computing side of it? So I think for me, there's, there's actually two elements that are, that are changing within the, uh, the warehouse. Uh, one is everybody's talking about wearables. Um, this whole idea of wearable technology has really accelerated. We, we're all doing it in our consumer lives. We've got smartwatches, uh, tracking devices for, for when we go out for our bike rides. Um, and in the warehouse, um, believe it or not, they've actually had a wearable mobile computer for over 20 years. Uh, back in the 1990s, <laughs> we actually had one. And, and one of those examples is in the London Design Museum. Um, but the evolution of that, the idea that now you can have uh, a barcode scanner on your finger, um, that for me is really how it's exploding, how we can have glasses that now have small screens on to give us information in our eye line. Uh, that I think is probably one of the most exciting areas. The second piece of that is also around the shift from green screen. Many warehouses are still using very old legacy uh, systems. 
Um, the old green screen where you need to understand how to navigate through it, function F4 if you're going to go do picking. Um, there is now this shift away from that, and users are starting to see apps that are actually friendly. It says, oh, I want to do picking. Let me push on the picking button. So when you consider the device and you consider the, the, how the users are interacting with them, those two together, I think, are, are really uh, causing a fundamental shift uh, in the workers uh, in warehouses today. But now people mostly mostly speak about the automation that's going on in, in the warehouses and then the robotization and so on. Uh, does the, these technologies that you mentioned have they are they, they a, bit, a bit shadowed uh, the, this development or or? That's a, that's, it's a good question. Yeah, I mean, as you said, automation is the next big thing. Robotics uh, is, is is the piece after that. Um, I don't know if they're shadowed. Um, I think almost in a warehouse, people take the mobile computers for granted. Um, they've been around for so long. They're such a fundamental piece of, of the uh, the workflows that people go through that they're almost, they are overlooked a little bit. I mean, the devices have moved forward a long way since those simple batch devices where you scanned, docked them, uh, and then you had to, to uh, reconnect to a network in order to synchronize. Um, the new technologies, yeah, automation, is coming along, but the, the mobile computers just supplement it. They work together. If you know, if you've got just in time activities going on, you've got something coming in that you need to get off the loading dock, actually getting that information to a worker to be there to receive it or to work with the automation to receive it uh, is even more crucial. So yes, you're probably right. It is a little overlooked. It's not the new sexy, um, but it, it is fundamental. And I think people that understand um, the benefits it can bring, uh, just having their minds opened about how you bring the two technologies together. Mm -hmm. And right now, you you talk a lot about the the need for modernization of, of the warehouse. Uh, and and in a recent study that you did last year, called Warehousing Vision Study, there seems to be a gap between the ambitions that that the many warehouse responsible people have. And, and the tech, uh, investments that they really do. What, what's holding companies back, do you think? Why don't they invest in, 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 the, in the pace that they would like to do? So I think some of that is down to the re return on investment expectations. I mean, you and I, with our mobile phones, we perhaps try and look to change them every couple of years. There's always new technology coming. If you look in the warehouse, the return on investment on a mobile computer can be upwards of five years. I know some customers that are still using devices that are nine years old because they're just good enough. Um, so I think the, there's a reluctance to invest in new technology when the old devices are good enough. Um, but I think perhaps those particular um, companies don't understand the complete benefits uh, that are coming. And also part of it does go back to my point about the warehouse management systems. They've not been easy to modernize. Uh, some WMS systems are 20, 30 years old. They're complex, they're expensive, um, and therefore trying to change what the user sees on their device um, versus uh, what they used to see uh, can be costly, can be time, uh, time consuming. And I think there's an a misapprehension that actually it's going to take too long to test it, too long to change the WMS system. So do you know what? We'll stick with, with, with what we have today. And, and I think that that's a, a little bit inaccurate with the new devices that we have. We have ways of taking those old screens and making them modern on a new device so that you can do more with them without having to have that big heavy investment of changing your WMS system. So I think as companies, companies see the benefits, they're trying to focus on how they can get there uh, and take those steps without obviously having to change the, the big costly WMS systems. Mm. I will give you an opportunity now to, to make kind of a sales pitch to, to the Nordic audience that we have here. Uh, and, and, and I will ask you to explain how the Zebra portfolio, a very broad portfolio of technologies for the warehouse, how it can help companies to become more efficient, effective and agile. And perhaps without these enormous investments that, that sometimes are, are, are needed or seem to be needed. Okay, thank you. So. Um, so what we offer is we've got a portfolio. We've got 
uh, one major architecture that sits underneath all of this, so the processor, the memory, the operating system is the latest Android operating system. Um, so we have that, if you think of that as a base level technology. And then what we do is we then change the form factor. So uh, we might have a vehicle computer that sits, it's robust, it's rugged, can withstand the vibrations, nice big screen um, so that the user can pause what they're doing, look at the screen, then continue driving their forklift. At the same time, we take the same, same technology and put it into a mobile computer that's got a long range scanner. It's got a battery that's going to last them 12 hours so that they don't have to be disrupted uh, within their operation just to, to switch the battery. Uh, and then we take the same technology and put it on a wrist. Um, so a wrist with a, a finger scanner. So we have these different shapes and it goes back to, to my earlier point about we try and design a product to do an activity. If you're picking, you want your hands free, you go through a wearable computer. If you're on a forklift, you might want a tablet or a vehicle computer. If you want something a bit more durable with a heater in it because you're going in and out of a freezer, then you perhaps need a more traditional device, a sort of a, a brick on a stick with a keypad that's got heaters in it so that it, it can work with gloves uh, and it can withstand that minus 25 degrees C temperature. So we've got this complete portfolio, but underlying it is this new technology. And the technology we have now is the technology we've kind of taken for granted in our mobile phones. So now we have sensors so we can understand uh, if a device has been dropped. Um, we've got the Bluetooth, things, simple things like tap to pair. We're used to tapping to pair our mobile phone with earphones. Well, now we can tap a mobile computer with a portable printer. And there you go. You've got a worker that's ready to do his, his picking and labeling very quickly rather than having to go through a lengthy synchronization and pairing activity. So the broad range of products we have combined with the technologies together really come together to give efficiencies in the warehouse. And if you're still using those old devices, they're well and good. The Microsoft devices are doing okay, but the Android devices with new technologies can offer so much more beyond the green screen. And then we've got some software solutions which we can help you with that take a uh, green screen and run it uh, on an Android. So if you've got green screen on your mobile computer today, uh, working with the likes of Avanti, uh, we can take the, the configuration file of that. We can very simply and automatically uh, email you back a different version that runs on your Android device. And then you've got two like for like, an old Microsoft, a new Android with the same look and feel and the users can instantly use it. And then we can modernize the application at a pace uh, that uh, our customers are confident with. So you can step from Microsoft to Android easy, and you can modernize and take the benefits at a pace that you really want to. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I said here earlier that, that in the old days, the, the warehouse work sometimes was described as dirty, dull, and dangerous. But it sounds like, like a lot of fun doing, doing this and having all these devices. Can, can you give me an idea of what, what you think the, the warehouse worker will look like uh, or the people, the competence in and around the warehouse in the future, in say five, five to ten years? So, so I think we're already seeing a shift in, in uh, the warehouse workers. I mean, they are expecting more. Uh, we've obviously got uh, labor limitations. We've, um, so therefore, uh, people are being a bit more choosy around where they work. Um, I've heard of customers that have lost staff to a new warehouse next door simply because that new warehouse has got uh, newer devices that are more comfortable to use for your 12-hour uh, shift. Um, so, so I think the users are shifting. I think as over the next five to 10 years, I think the users are going to continue to demand and expect more of them. I think the technologies, uh, the challenge with technology is got to keep up and be beneficial to them. So the technology has got to be easier to use. If you've got somebody shifting between picking and packing, how can the technology support them in that? How can it make it easier for them to get training? Um, how can it also be easier for them to, to switch roles and very quickly get up to speed in terms of that new activity? We see workers being bonused in the warehouse on, on their efficiencies. The technology needs to support them in that. So if the technology can help them learn the quickest route round uh, the warehouse, or if it can do step by step, right, do this activity followed by that activity, 
then it's going to make it much easier for them to hit their bonuses. They're going to be more motivated. So I think the workers, uh, to answer your original question, the workers are going to um, expect more from the technology. I, they te the, the workers themselves shouldn't necessarily need to be any more uh, technically capable, simply because if the device is easy to use, they'll pop it on and they'll be able to crack on and uh, do their work to the best their, of their ability. So they don't have to, to get go any courses and become IT specialists or anything like that. In the if we've designed a mobile computer that you've got to go on a two days training to learn how to use it, then we've done it all wrong. Mm. Uh, the number of, of workers in the warehouses uh, are decreasing, of course, steadily. But do you think we will have any any manual labor in the in the warehouse in let's say ten years from now? So I, I, there is this talk of a, yeah, as you say, a, a fully autonomous warehouse. Um, I'm not sure we're going to get there in the next 10 years. I think a lot of the activities that we need to perform in the warehouse still require sort of manual dexterity, being able to pick up, sort uh, and uh, move items around. So I, I, I don't see manual work uh, moving out of the warehouse. I, I can see it being redeployed. Um, I believe that there's, uh, it's coming closer where we're going to see uh, robots and workers working side by side. So instead of a, a, a worker perhaps um, pushing a trolley up and down every aisle in order to do their picking, um, I can see a robot bringing a trolley to a worker so that they can focus on the aisle that they're working on to pick into that. And then the robot will take that trolley onto the next aisle to the next worker. Uh, and a, a new trolley to turn up for that worker in that aisle. So I think we're going to just see a um, an increase in efficiencies of workers and automation working together. And as I said, I think the workers are just going to get redeployed. There are some areas where if you're doing small item picking, you simply need more people. So if you can maintain the same number of workers in a warehouse, but increase productivity through uh, robotics, through automation, then it's a win-win all round. So I don't see the worker being replaced. I see it as a, as a partnership. And we've already got some customers that are starting to trial this uh, in very early uh, stages. I think there's also another spin to it. it it's, it's, I think the technology will be there. It, it's about the cost of the technology. I mean, how much more efficient can one robot be to one worker? But then what's the cost difference? Um, mm. So I think um, there's a lot of focus within warehouses at the moment around how to equip and train uh, warehouse staff, because obviously if you've got temporary workers coming in, if you can bring them up to speed more quickly, then you don't have to take them two weeks on and uh, take them on two weeks in advance of the uh, peak season. You can take them a week in advance. So really, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's about that balance of the, the technology capable versus the actual cost of it. I mean, again, we're all running businesses here. Um, and if a robot costs X, but five workers cost Y, you've got to do your maths and figure out what's the best all round. Thank you so much, Paul Reed, for your, your interest in Infotere and our discussion. Thank, Thank you. you.